Okay, folks, welcome. Uh, let's go ahead and get started with the newest of our special interest groups. And when I say special interest groups, some of you may not be familiar with what we've been building up over the course of the last couple of years. But whenever we find a concentration of people who are enthusiastic about a particular topic of woodworking, we wanna, we wanna foster that. We wanna provide a means by which they get together and sort of share in that enthusiasm and uh, grow a community. They can bring in speakers, they can do projects, they can teach one another, learn from one another, socialize. I mean, there's just some great things that come out of having a special interest group. And with recent changes, which this meeting in particular is all about, with so many changes that have happened of late, it's something that uh, we wanted to make you folks aware of, and it may prove to be a springboard for an uh, ongoing special interest group. So I'd like to just welcome you and uh, take you through what will be our upcoming agenda, which is largely updates, but we're gonna finish off in the end with um, some feedback from you folks, because we'd like to know if one, you're interested in a special interest group, and then what you'd like to see happen in a special interest group. Because if there is enough of shared interest and a good agenda and topics we wanna to cover, then we can have this uh, go on. Just as a quick sidebar, we are a relatively nascent group. For the first two to three years, we had turning going on, but it wasn't super disciplined, wasn't pushed, the equipment wasn't necessarily in the best locations. It didn't take off, I guess is the bottom line. But over the course of that time, we still had over 50 people who ended up with some sort of relationship to turning. And with recent developments, which Mary Russo is going to be sharing with us in a second, uh, it seems to be that that's changing. We seem to have reached maybe a liftoff stage and we want to take advantage of that by forming the special interest group, if there's interest in that, and also in just growing the turning program. Because we at the SDFWA in the shop will be growing new turners and uh, we have another organization in the county, the San Diego Wood Turners, who is for really experienced and really high-end sorts of wood turning. And so we've done a collaboration with them. We have several people on this call that are from that group. Mary, for instance, is a longtime member of the uh, SDWT. I'm a member. We have about five or six others here who are as well. So there's this collaboration that we've had on several fronts and uh, we hope to grow more and more turners so that they become really good. They'll be with us and they'll also add to that other community. So to begin with, we're gonna talk about uh, changes in the shop. Mary and Paul are going to, I guess we're missing Peter, Mary and Paul, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, Mary and Paul are gonna tell us about many changes of uh, equipment in the shop. We're then gonna get an update on certification for those of you who aren't aware. Certification is needed to use certain equipment such as the lasers, such as the lathes, the CNC, et cetera. And uh, there have been some changes in that we're going to update folks on. There are some new classes. We've actually had quite a few new classes lately taught by Larry, who I believe is on the call as well. And um, let's see. Oh, we need to get uh, somebody else in here. I've just added another person into the room here. Uh, so we're going to get an update on classes. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about online resources for this special interest group. And then we want to go into a discussion of just what people would like to see in a special interest group. I'm gonna be transitioning now the spotlight to the camera here that is being used for the special interest group. Um, Mary is going to be talking and Paul is helping us out with um, being the cameraman behind the scenes. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, unmute them and put the spotlight. Everybody, yes, we can hear you, so go right ahead. Okay, okay. yeah, good. Okay, so we're just gonna go, we're in the shop and we kind of closed the slot down for a few minutes, so a little bit quick uh, review of what's going on now. We have donated from JET four new JET mini lathes, and we have one of them set up here on the table. Unfortunately, they're not variable speed, so they have a pulley system and you have to, you know, change the pulley position to speed up or to slow down. 
and we have four positions for them to be set up with these nice, uh, what do you call these? Uh, anyway, screws that tighten, tighten them, the boards down into the, into the table. And then we have storage for all four of them out in the shop. So Paul's gonna pan the storage underneath this table. So if you come in on a shop slot and you wanna use a, a lathe, you can pull one of these out if you don't wanna use the bigger lathes. And there's two positions on this table to set up jet lathes. And then there's one position, a taller position on this table and a taller position on this table. Um, other than that, what we did was organize all of our tools and they're locked away mostly. In the guidelines that we wrote, our new guidelines, we are requiring anybody who's turning to wear a face shield. So we do have four face shields. So for the beginner classes or anybody who shows up without one, they're all in plastic bags and we have Windex and paper towels to keep them clean after you're done turning. And then we made drawers to lock away all of our equipment. So there's four drawers down here set up for the jets, the small jet legs with two live drives and two, uh, I mean, two live um, centers. centers and two drive centers. Uh, Nova chuck and, and the screw and the screw chuck if you want to use a screw chuck and each one has a little light if you want to make it light and we have a face plate. So each one of these four drawers has those equipment for that lathe. And then we have a powermatic drawer which has the wrenches and a bigger chuck for the large powermatic. And then a, another drawer here for the Rikon lathe and then the top two drawers are accessories so measuring tools circle tools calipers and drill chucks and even pen mandrels so at this point that's most of our supplies and that's all on the wall underneath the right and then on this wall we set up the tools that we provide at the shop, but you're always welcome to bring in your own tools and to sharpen your own tools the way you want. But we like these tools sharpened according to our guidelines. Okay, other than that, we have CBN wheels now that were donated by you, by one of our members. And so we have our turning station set up Unfortunately, it's a little distance away right now on the other side of the shop, but we have our bench grinder with our two eight-inch CBN wheels here. Mandanum is last covered on the right-hand side. Something has gone in its place and it's out here on the counter right now. We have our angle guides and our jigs. Uh, for uh, sharpening our spindle gouges, our spindle roughing gouges, and our pin gouges. So right now, I'm going to put a two-inch uh, port to, to measure your distance. So right now, that's sort of the program we have. Um, we do have new guidelines that I believe are posted on the website. And in a minute, we're going to talk about classes and underneath classes and underneath this SIG, we have four videos that were produced by Larry Sapplenick, and they cover all of the beginning processes. So sharpening and beads, coves, bead cuts, and carving, all of the basic cuts that you learn in the beginning spindle class. So those are great review options for people that have taken the class or people that have had a class in the past and want to see how we are teaching here. So for now, I think that's good. Okay, Mary. We'll move on to classes. Mary, do you suppose you could uh, just take us uh, back? Travis, I'm, I'm going to reset into the front classroom. So give us a moment to do okay. that and Actually, get the shop back going. Can you Turn hear me? Over to you. Can you hear me? Thank you. Paul? 
All right, we'll just allow them to transition and go back to the um, classroom. I was gonna ask them if they would please go back to the uh, large lathes that we have in the corner. Um, those large lathes are going to be sold and we're going to be replacing them. Normally what we would do is we would say, hey, you wanna find out what equipment we have? Well, then why don't you go to our website and look at our uh, existing equipment. And uh, we, if you were to do that, bear with me, that's the wrong screen to be sharing right now. If you were to do that, you would see the page I'm about to show you. And the page I'm about to show you is not current. So this is what you would see. You would see a, you're not seeing it. <laughs> Can somebody please tell me what they see on their screen right now? A Powermatic 3520 and a Jet Mini Lay. Thank you very much, Karen. So that is what I intended to show you. And that is an example of what we'll be updating on the website. So that Powermatic, which you saw in the back corner next to the tools that Mary was showing us, that will be going on sale. And the jet mini lathes that you see on the right hand side here, those were all gone already. So we'll be updating the website to reflect what we're getting. And as Mary showed you, we already have a bunch of these new jet mini lathes that Gary was able to get donated to us, the four of them. And so those you already saw. What you didn't see is that we also have just placed in order to replace those two large lathes, the Powermatic, which I mentioned, and the Rikon, which was just above the accessories cart that Mary showed us. And it's with set up. this American, American Beauty. Now, I mention this with a little bit of pride in my voice because while I've only been turning for two years, anybody I talk to about what the Cadillac Paramount lathe is turns to the American Beauty by Robust. And this is one of those things that you can do that really jolts uh, a community. If you can say that by being a part of a community and by learning turning, you can actually grow and have better and bigger and higher quality tools available to you, then it draws people in, it encourages growth and learning, et cetera. And so we have purchased this lathe. Now, we've only purchased the lathe. In the bottom right hand corner, you can see what we got. We've got the long bed with a three horsepower upgrade, tilt away uh, tail, stock area with gas assist, and a variety of rests. But we need a lot more accessories for this in order for it to get to be the wide, fully functional, great tool that we want it to be. It's already going to be phenomenal but we have places to go. But this is one of those things that you'll see on the website when it gets updated, as well as what we saw with the um, jets. And those are the pieces of equipment. Now, I mentioned we were selling the Robust, excuse me, we were selling the Powermatic, which you see on the left-hand side here, and the Rikon, which was another one. And we had um, John just a minute ago say that we were also going to be selling the Delta. Uh, John, could you again say what it was that we were selling and what the price was going to be? Oh, uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Okay, yeah. Uh, it's a Delta model number 46-700. It's a 12-inch variable speed wood lathe. Uh, it uh, is approximately 30-inch between centers and has a 12-inch swing on it. And uh, it's no longer being sold new. However, when it was being sold new, it listed for $598 without uh, a stand. Uh, the one that the shop has for sale has a stand on it. It looks absolutely brand new. It's seen very, very little use. And we're asking $175 for it, oh uh, which I think is one heck of a swing and deal. Uh, I will be at the shop. Uh, I'm, I'm teaching an intro to woodworking class tomorrow from eight to noon. 
Uh, I will be at the shop uh, quite a bit earlier than eight o'clock if someone wants to come by and look at it. And I can certainly take a, a 10 or 15 minute break uh, between eight and noon to uh, show you the lathe if anybody wants to come by the, the shop and look at it for look at it tomorrow. But I think at the price point that we're asking, it's certainly not gonna last long. And uh, in addition to that, I think Travis, you have some information on those, uh, uh, those two chucks uh, that uh, were floating around in the classroom yesterday. Yeah, I saw them yesterday. I don't remember the details of those two chucks, but let me just draw attention to what you folks just heard. On the one hand, it could look like we are promoting the sale of some items and it's like a commercial. It's absolutely the opposite. It's the opportunity for people within a community of shared interest to actually get access to things that they might not be able to, uh, a decent lathe at a good price, and uh, accessories that happen to be sitting in the bench room that are available for free, or maybe chucks that are at half or a quarter price. These are opportunities that come from having a community. And while John just mentioned the Delta, we will, in the near-term future, be selling both the Powermatic and the Rycon as well. Now, as I said, we have this American Beauty. It'll take a couple of months to get here. It's just the beginning. And we have a lot of the funding for this, but we still are looking forward to adding to this. And one particular thing I know we want to add is we need to get some chucks for this. And one in particular is a, a 120 Vicar, Vimar chuck, because if we have that, um, Bob Hacker, who has been behind this initiative more than anybody else from a funding perspective, Bob Hacker will give us his long worth chucks and he has two that will allow us to mount really large bowls and platters and things on the uh, American Beauty. So I mentioned, the, uh, I mentioned that to you because we still want to continue to fundraise on this. Um, you could either, for instance, if you're interested in contributing, uh, leave a check in the office at the shop um, and that would be taken care of by deposit to the bank or you can also go to just PayPal me dot, excuse me, paypal.me slash SDFWA, and you're able to uh, make a con contribution there. But uh, let's transition to the next topic because that was an update on equipment. Now we'd like to say a little bit about the new certification process. But before we go into the little bit of details on that, I just want to describe to you again, what it is that we have gone through over the prior three years up until this point. We had less than strong discipline around turning. We had inconsistencies. And frankly, in the last few months during COVID, we have made significant changes. And those significant changes are what people need to be made aware of. And that's why the certification has been started up anew. We all will end up going through some certification because policies have changed because we have new equipment, we're keeping things in different places, etc. cetera. So um, Mary, is there anything that you would like to talk about with regard to the changes? I know that we have new safety guidelines and we have a new safety test. And we also have some updated policies and um, equipment lists, that sort of a thing. So we will be sending out a link to where all the documents are for this process, but anybody who was certified needs to go through a new certification process. And uh, that will be detailed in an email that we sent out. Would you add anything that, to that, Mary? Not really. Um, you know, we wrote guidelines. We really didn't have guidelines before. And so I just want to make sure that everybody who's going to turn at the shop has read, read the guidelines and are familiar with what our expectations are for safety. And then just like use of the rest of the shop before you could participate in a shop slot, you had to do a safety test, a hands on safety test, and you had to do a written test on specific pieces of equipment. Our written test is only six questions. It just basically shows that you've read the guidelines and that you're understanding them. And then our hands-on safety 
is really very basic. I want to make sure that people, we want to make sure that people that are turning and have only taken a beginner's class, a single spindle class or two spindle classes have a good understanding of the things they need, need to do to maintain safety at all times when they're using the lathes. So they're really pretty basic functions. Um, I can make some exceptions for people that are pros that have had a lot of experience and a lot of other classes, but a lot of the people that are coming through are beginners and have only taken one or two classes. We specialize in beginners, <laughs> <laughs> which means we have to take an extra measure of uh, caution to make sure that everything stays, stays safe. And then the other thing is, is that we provide some tools, you know, basic tools. They're available for our classes. They're available for use for people that come to the shop. But we want to standardize how those tools are sharpened so that you don't come in and sharpen them the way you want them. If you want tools sharpened a specific way for your purposes, then you need to buy your own tools. Yeah, Doug makes the point that the hands-on safety test includes demonstrating how to properly sharpen. And uh, that's yes. such an important part of turning. That it, if you don't know our particular jigs and how actually we want them sharpened, it's not good for our tools. And so everybody needs to at least be able to show that they're familiar with that and using it correctly. Right. Okay. So let's transition now to the topic of education. And Mary, I'm going to go ahead and bring on the education page. I'm going to scroll down it. Maybe you could just mention briefly what it is that we're looking at. Uh, let me bring it up here. Okay, so you folks should now be able to see that uh, the turning, this is on the website, and it was simply in the education area. Uh, and I'll be going down this, and this is, uh, these are a lot of classes that a couple have been provided in the past, but they're really cranking up in frequency and in variety. So the first one here, basic spindle turning. So basic spindle turning is exactly that. We just teach you using basic tools, a spindle roughing gouge, a spindle gouge, a parting tool, um, how to take a, take a square two by two or whatever to round, how to do beads, coves, bee cuts, and parting, um, and, and to do all of that safely. So um, it's the basic beginner class on how to, how to make a spindle. And uh, just as a point here, Mary mentioned previously that there were these basic videos that were done by Larry. Uh, so this is a reference that you can turn to as well. So the first one, basic spindle turning. So then a pen class, it's a continuation. You have to have basic turning first, basic spindle turning first. So turning a pen is basically turning a spindle. It's very small, but you can make beads and coves. Um, and it's kind of fun because you end up with a nice little product in the end. And nice little examples down there. Next is bowl turning. Basic bowl turning is beginning bowl turning. So I know that I, I'm pretty sure you only make one small bowl in the class, but he takes you through using a, um, a bowl gouge, sharpening the bowl gouge, and then safely mounting your, uh, your work to start turning it to round, turning the outside, turning the inside, and finishing your bowl. So you probably won't end up with fancy bowls like that, but you'll end up with a bowl. <laughs> Very popular class, and it's almost always waitlisted. The next one is spindle turning again, just Actually, to get more experience great. with spindle turning. Mary, just so people know, we're now entering the section called waitlist, and these are ones which we need to have a critical mass in order to offer. The ones that were above, there's enough demand they are scheduled. And on the subsequent classes you're about to hear about, we need to see your interest in our wait lists and then they get scheduled. So I'm sorry, I just want to make that transition for you, Mary. Go ahead. Oh, that's fine. So a weed pot is basically a little vase, right? It has a, a hole in the center so that you can either insert a test tube or you can just use it for dry cut flowers. Um, and you can practice using your spindle turning techniques. Uh, just as an example, here's where you would have clicked if you wanted to get on the waiting list for the Weed Vaz, uh class. 
So then the next one in the series, again, it's on the wait list would be plates and platters. So you graduate from doing small bowls into doing some plates and platters, small again in the class, but you're going flat, more flat instead of deep and round. Um, okay. so just more experience. And then he's gonna offer natural edge bowl where you're leaving the bark on the upper rim of the bowl takes a little bit extra effort to get those mounted properly on the lathe. So he'll go through the process of mounting those and, and, and preparing your wood stock for the lathe. And then we haven't ever had an advanced bowl class yet, but he plans on offering an advanced bowl class. I don't know, I mean, what he's gonna, well, he's gonna, I see up here, he's gonna put, um, inlay and other other things and then bring in the three the buffing wheel system so that you can buff the outside of your bowls um, after you've got a finish on them so those are all classes that are going to be offered by larry here at the shop um, and if you are interested or have an interest in learning something different or a specific project you just need to bring that up with Dallas or me or you know someone in the Travis someone in the shop and if we get enough interest then we could maybe add another class whether it be Larry or me or Sally or whoever wanted to teach an, another class excellent um so folks we're about to transition to talking about SIG but we've covered some pretty big ideas here we've talked about the equipment that we're getting the equipment we're going to be getting rid of, changes in the shop, the certifications that are needed to get access to the current shop setup for turning, and also upcoming classes. So I wanted to pause right now and just if somebody has questions, this is a really good time to ask them about those topics before we go into just talking about the uh, uh, idea of a special interest group. Now go ahead and unmute yourself if you have any questions and just throw them out there. Let's see what we can do to help you. Are you guys saying that Mary was that good? A lot of hands. How do we schedule, how do we schedule a hands-on certification retest? Can everybody hear me? Yes. You can email me. I'm doing hands-on certification and now I've trained Mike Reedy and he's also doing hands-on certification. So between one of the two of us, we would contact you and set up a date and a time. We try to do all the certifications when the shop is not in use so that we can talk and not have that dust system <laughs> making all the background noise. So Mary, could you have Paul type in the two email addresses into the chat window so that people have reference to that? Sure. Everybody, Paul, the man who's normally on the other side of the camera. <laughs> Uh, Other questions? Uh, I don't know Mike's, so just email me and I, I can assign you to Mike. Tom, I love the backdrop of your scene. I love Yosemite. Oh yeah, yeah. I would often have a Yosemite shirt on too. I absolutely love that place. Uh, other questions on the topics of equipment, policies and procedures, certification, classes, things like that? Because this that is the bulk of what this call is about. It's to update you on all the changes. And there are a lot of changes. So we tried to organize them and present them in a way that would come across quickly, but we could have left holes. And so this is your chance to get those holes filled with asking a question or two. Everybody's just waiting to get past this Q&A period, I can tell. <laughs> do, you, do you guys use uh, carbide tools too or just the traditional high-speed steel tools we only provide a traditional high-speed steel tools in the shop but if you are a member and you wanted to come here and turn using our lathes you could bring your own carbide tools okay we won't we won't stop you from using your own tools even though i'll tell you that in mary's heart <laughs> High speed steel is the way to go. <laughs> you don't scrape, you cut. <laughs> Other questions? And if not, we'll just go ahead and move on to the next topic. 
Okay. What I'd like to do is the next topic is just tell you a little bit about um, online resources and the notion of a special interest group. So I'm going to actually share the screen now with the SDFWA website. And uh, I mean, hopefully most of you have seen this. It's uh, been revamped entirely in the last year. But in this menu system we have along here is an, a menu called community. And the third item down there is special interest groups. So if we click on that, we should be able to then see the variety of interest groups that have come about since the COVID period. Uh, a phenomenal one is hand tools. Paul has done an incredible job. We have a laser special interest group. We have one that was formed before we had COVID to bring the community of women together and it was women who would work. There's our Mary Russo. And I want you to note here that it says she is temporary. Mary is leading the way to getting us started, but she's only doing it temporarily. We're going to be trying to find somebody to fill her shoes just because it's her preference not to do that. And so we'll be walking in the direction of trying to find a leader. And we're actually talking with some people already about that. But we also have a CNC special interest group, a design special interest group. We have a scrolling special interest group. This one's been idle during COVID. Uh, we have the luthiers who get together regularly and uh, 3D printing with that guy with an ugly mug. This one right here is unfortunately not happening anymore. Doug, as I said, moved away, exercised poor judgment to leave us, but uh, we do still have the longstanding carving sig. Now, I mentioned this because these are all areas that people have rallied around. And each time we have a community that rallies around a topic, we want to harness that energy. So going back up to the turning SIG, I want to just note that there is a turning page. And on the turning page, you'll find things that you would want to have access to. For instance, there's an entire discussion system where people can, when they have ideas or questions, whatever, we'll go there in a second, but it's linked to from here. Seeing what equipment we have. Right now it's not current, but we'll be showing all our equipment. These are places that are available online, recommended, recommended places for buying online, equipment that makes uh, that is recommended, places locally that we have uh, deals with or our sources of material. For instance, up here, Gary just did a deal with Penn State. And if you choose to get on their list, that is to say by providing a little information about yourself, then they'll give you a 10% discount on everything. A lot of these things are long-standing partners of ours and sources of wood. So if you're doing this, you want to know these things. Uh, here we have safety documents that uh, we want to make available <clears throat> to see. Mary, these are the ones you were referencing earlier, correct? I'm not 100% sure. I've never opened them. <laughs> ah, okay. And then there are the tutorials. These are the ones that Larry put together for us. And then right. there's the online resource. So when people get interested around things, we meet regularly, we share resources. When we go get together physically, we get together online. So just quickly, I'm gonna take you to this, which is our discussion area. Uh, in general, our discussion area is broken up into, you have projects that you've done, share them here and people talk about them. Um, you have questions, you can click here and ask and get questions answered from the community. Here's where we have the bulk of our, <coughs> So we have over 300 messages already in this area. And turning is one of our latest additions, but I wanted to bring it to your attention because this is where when you're not with people, you can go and participate in interactions from the community. And so let's go back to that. I just wanted to have you see that on the website, there is that community area and we'd like to grow that out if people are interested in it. And again, all the special interest groups are there in the community tab. Now, when it comes to what we do in special interest groups, let me give you just a couple of examples. Uh, let me choose from, say, the hand tools. Paul Duffield has turned his more into an instructive two-time-a-month um, event. And I have been introduced to more tools I had no idea even existed because of attending his Saturday morning gatherings. And he puts on a demo and he tells us about how to make some of these tools ourselves. And it's a great Q&A and a little over an hour, we're done and it's been fantastic. 
Um, there is another one, which is say the design special interest group. Well, in that one, we're now entering into a phase where we're actually designing things for a purpose. So for instance, we're making these folding tables, actually they're little desks for kids in school who can't go to school. So elementary age students who don't have a desk or a place to work at home, but they also don't have a lot of room at home. So there's a design effort going on right now and we're all collaborating around that. Um, there are things like in the laser sig where a new technique will come along or a new tool will come about and we'll design a meeting around that. So these are the kinds of things that can take place in a special interest group. And I wanted to lay those out in front of you just because I'd like to transition now to ask what people would like to see in a SIG. And let's get a little conversation going here because from this, we might be able to establish that yes, there is interest. And then secondly, maybe what the first one or two or three agendas might be how often to hold it and things like that. I'll tell you that a good default is maybe once a month. So um, folks, what do you, would you like to see in a special interest group? Unmute yourself before you talk. So I'm concluding we should not have a special interest group. Uh, Travis, this there is Doug. Yes. I, I, I would like to learn how to do um, hollow form uh, turning. So I know there's a whole special skill set for that and a special set of tools. So I would love those more experienced turners to share with me on what tools that they use for hollow form turning and, um, and, and techniques also. Okay, so I, that is such a great example of how someone who wants to know something can turn to the rest of the community and get insight. So you choose a theme, hollow form. And maybe there are four or five people who really know how to do it well, and they have slightly different insights. So you establish an agenda around hollow form, and you ask those four or five people if they would share what they know. And all of a sudden, what was tiny pockets of information become information available to the entire community who attend the SIG. That's a great example, Doug, thank you. We have other ones out there? Um, Travis, this is Joe. Um, to uh, sort of answer that question, um, but do it in a more general way. One thing that I think would be worthwhile is given that, and I think Sally's going to nod when I say this. Um, uh, since we, you know, we've been longtime members of the San Diego Wood Turners, both of us. I've been a longtime member of the Fine Woodworkers, and one of the things that I really like that we've been doing since COVID started is we've been doing a lot more collaboration. And I think what we should maybe do on um, the, uh, the SIG website or you know, wherever is cross-reference um, where we have interests like that. So I'll say, for example, uh, in our club and the San Diego uh, Woodturners Club, we have a professional woodturner, Mike Joukowsky, who specializes in hollow forms. And uh, although I don't know that we've had a class with him for uh, over a year now, because he's been dealing with some cancer issues, but I think he's back. Um, that would be an, an example where if we have a class offered there, um, we can leverage or, you know, cross-link into that and people can uh, jump in and, and uh, re uh, utilize the resources going both directions that way, um, as opposed to trying to do something different from our side and their side, because it's really the same content. Assuming there's enough slots, right? If the, we need more slots, um, uh, you've been mentioning Larry. Who is what's Larry's last name? Afrinit. Okay, I, that's why I thought it was. Um, Larry is a very experienced turner, of course, and uh, um, and uh, he could actually do that too. And there's a lot of people around locally that can teach a class like that if we decide we wanted to go that way. But I'm just saying we ought to try to leverage what happens in both courts because I think. Um, um, you said something early on in the, in the thing that uh, the San Diego Woodturners uh, tends to have more experienced um, turners. And that's not really true. Um, we have a lot of stuff focused on beginners um, in our club. And uh, so there's, there's, you know, a lot of opportunity. Now, to keep a lot of interest, we tend to bring in professionals a lot. We, of course, they're doing more experienced stuff. So you know, we have every every intention of collaborating. Yeah, yeah. We have you here. We have Sally here. Uh, uh, we have uh, 
Uh, obviously, Mary, who's a member of both, I'm a member of both. We talk with uh, Brian all the time. We have every intention of trying to maximize and not duplicate. And uh, we have some launching activities right now, and we would love to figure out how to draw that line. And with people's input like yours, I think we'll get there. And I think it's going to be good for turning across the county. Um, I see in the chat that uh, Tom Schultz mentions the education format. He likes the idea of having that be one of the things that we do in a special interest group. Um, Lewis says, talk about wood turning. Well, that's a pretty good idea in a, in a turning SIG. Thank you very much, Lewis. <laughs> um, then there's another person who says, um, oh, I guess that was... That was it. Those were some additional comments in the chat. I have another idea that I'd like to share, which is if we, uh, uh, one of the things I do when I teach, um, you know, I teach uh, stuff here in my shop or when I mentor people from the club or whoever is calling. Um, oh, that, I, actually, that's a resource. Uh, the San Diego Woodturners has a mentors program with people that volunteer to help, you know, one on one. Uh, they'll feel afraid to go to their website and look that up. Um, and we're all over the county, so um, there's always somebody pretty close by. But when I bring people over here, one of the things I do is I give them a tour of my house, not, not to look at the house, but to look at all the wood terrain that I've collected over the years. I have stuff that I've done, and I have stuff that a lot of other people have done, and I show all the different things you can do with wood terrain. So one of the things we could do in the SIG, if you wanted to, is do a, even a virtual tour where somebody would walk around with their phone on Zoom and show some of the stuff that they have if they have a collection to work with. You know, like right over my right shoulder, because I got the backwards thing, right over there, you see something copper right there. That's something I did in a class almost 20 years ago with Michael Hosla. It's a box that's shaped like a worm. You know, yeah. and there's all kinds of stuff that you can show and tell. That, was, that, that, that phrase right there, Joe, I think is key. We also just saw Mike Reedy suggest that in the chat. That is an ingredient in almost every special interest group. Towards the end, have people show projects that they've done recently. Not only is it fun, but it also inspires folks. So show and tell is a very distinct thing. Lewis has his hands up. Did, Lewis, did you want to say something? Yes, sir. I just had a statement like, you know, when Paul and I do the SIG, one of the things that we've noticed is that content can start to become uh, a little bit of a challenge. And so whenever you take a look at it from an instructional or an educational perspective, maybe sprinkling out some kind of demo of Mary doing something incredible that Mary does, like with the bottle stoppers and things like that. Uh, you know, these kinds of different aspects of wood turning that are both like what Paul does. Some things are very intro level, like anybody could get a hammer and do it. And the other stuff is very advanced. So just kind of uh, crossing that whole threshold of capability, uh, I think catches the most people. But at the end of the day, it's just all of us getting together because we're interested. And right. you, know, you don't have to be smart. You just got to be interested. And I think Mary does an excellent job of demonstrating that skill set when she does the safety exams. And so just, just continuing that kind of stuff and just sharing, sharing that. One of the, the last thing I have is one of the things I noticed with the San Diego Woodturners is that they have an entire mentors page of people willing to be a mentor. I think, uh, you know, I've asked about that with the flat board stuff. Um, it's just really not there, you know, it's just, uh, I guess it's just not how the culture is, not that that's a positive or negative, it just isn't uh, average, uh, but you know, it sounds like with wood turners it is, and so maybe that's something to get going as well, is a wood turners mentor program within the San, Di uh, San Diego Fine Woodworking Association, because uh, I know Lewis needs some oversight, and uh, you know, <laughs> if someone's willing to take that on, Mary, uh, let me know. Over. <laughs> So you're talking in that last piece about a big hole in our current SDFWA organization. There used to be a mentoring program. As we made a lot of changes, it fell by the wayside. We really do, do need to pick that up. But just in terms of turning and mentoring, I've heard from several people that the mentoring done in the San Diego wood turners is exceptional. Um, it is. I've, yeah, I've gone through it. Been, yeah, you've told me it's, several times. You've even become one now, right? Yeah. Well, no, I'm not for them. I haven't. No, but I, I have taught other people. Yes. Okay. But um, they have some extremely passionate, amazing people. And then every now and then they do uh, get togethers up there at their facility uh, in San Marcos, where they'll have six or seven of their mentors come in 
for beginners. Um, something you guys could do, it really gets a lot of interest going because people who are afraid to, to put their put a tool to the to wood, uh, they get you over that fear and they're, they're, they're so good about it. Um, yeah. I, I agree that that would be a, a tremendous thing to bring into this group. So let me um, make one distinction, which is the two organizations will hopefully settle into a way that's complementary. And uh, let me give you the example that comes to mind. Uh, Sally puts together their regular programs. They're amazing. They're also two and a half to three hours long. And they're demos with video and just remarkable quality. A special interest group is never going to get there. I don't think they should even try to do that. It's a different thing. So that might be one way which the two organizations are different. If we are able to get a mentoring program going, great. But I'll tell you, there's an excellent mentoring program in the San Diego Woodturners. So there hopefully will settle after the dust comes down, uh, sort of a difference between the two where we know our respective roles. And at least so far, we were talking about growing new turners here and those who are really passionate joining the other community as well. And so- Hey, Travis, I don't know to interrupt you, but I think that fellow was meaning for other topics too at San Diego Fine Woodworking. Uh, basic skill, but there's some people who go through the, the basic class and are still yes. terrified to start a project. Yes, I'm talking, about, I'm talking about the monthly program that Sally does. Uh, sorry, somebody was going to say something. Go ahead. No, he, he's talking about be, the beginning basic woodworking classes with flatwood. People take our, our beginning Correct. classes and then they're afraid to come in. And I think the same thing is true. People take our basic turning class, spindle turning class, and then they either didn't feel comfortable with it or they just decided they didn't enjoy it or they're afraid to come in and and get more experience. And there's there's not really a source for them to come in and get more experience. Uh, although next weekend there is, and I think there's one slot still open. So what Mary is talking about is the beginner shop slot. Yeah. Can I, can I say something here? Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, we're kind of getting off, back, off track a little bit because I know this is a turning sig, but uh, just very briefly, uh, we are, uh, uh, and Travis, you're probably aware of this, uh, going to uh, 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 change our format for the introduction to woodworking classes in which it's going to be a three class series with the third class being exactly uh, what you're talking about, Lewis, which is a, a mentorship where you come into the shop with your own project in mind and uh, we provide mentorship, uh, a one-on-one -on -one, a relationship with you to complete your first project of your own design. In addition to that, we offer uh, classes, I believe on Saturdays, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, for beginning woodworkers where we have uh, extra shift supervisors on hand in order to help you with your project that you're trying to start or complete. And uh, speaking for myself as a shift supervisor, I get, uh, beginner woodworkers in on my shifts with somewhat reg regularity. And um, I make a special effort uh, to help them uh, answer any questions they have. If there's a setup or, or, or something having to do with a piece of equipment they don't quite understand, I, I try and, uh, well, I don't try. I do take the time to explain everything, make sure that you're on the right track. And I think I speak for all the other shift supervisors that do the same darn thing. Right. So uh, while maybe, uh, it's not quite what your expectations are. We're making some progress in those areas. So John, let me take that comment about how we have shop supervisors available to help. We also have these Sunday beginning woodworker classes. We're changing the intro to woodworking so that the last session is more independent and grows confidence and the ability to spend time in the shop with uh, confidence to what we were talking about to begin with. And by taking us back to turning and taking us back to a comment that was made by Marvin earlier on in the chat. He says, I need practice. I need to get access to our lathes. And sometimes just wanting to do it is not enough to get you over the hump to yeah. using the lathes. And yeah. so that is probably something where as we grow this community and as we have people who know one another, it's easier for us to be able to say, oh, sure, 
I can meet you at the shop and give you some mentoring. Or uh, you can find out that Mary is going to be the shop supervisor. So it's a good time to go in and get a shop slot because Mary would be there or you would be there, John. And so I think that as the community grows and it becomes effective by building relationships and growing familiarity with how the shop operates, what our tools are, et cetera, that it will make it easier for, in, in the case of Marvin, while I know he's a turner, he did make the comment that he just wants to gain access to our lathes. And so there's an there's a impediment there. Uh, maybe the Sunday basic woodworking, uh, beginner's woodworking shops would also be a good time for doing that. But um, that all, I think, that all argues for us becoming a community where we can support one another and we can get resources like that available. We have a voice if we have a community. Um, Sally, did you say you wanted to add something? Yes, I was going to say that once we can get back together in person, what we did at the Wood Turners is we had a thing every, every other Tuesday in the late afternoon. <clears throat> and a number of us would show up. The, we brought out as many lathes as we needed. People brought their tools if they had them. If they didn't have them, they used our tools. And it was just a introductory, get your hands on it. And that went very well for quite a long time. Of course, now we can't do it. But practice is, is the big deal. If you don't have a lathe at home, it's very hard to get practice. So I don't know what your process is for having, for using the lathe at your shop. If, you know, if you just want to come in and make shavings and, and get good at your tool skills. So. Yeah, the problem, I mean, they can do that. I mean, our shop slots are open to any equipment in the shop. So they just need to make a reservation in the shop, shop slot and then they can come in and use the lathe. The issue is, is most of our shop supervisors do, are, do not use the lathe. So, yeah. you know, I'm I'm there two yeah. days a month and and so it's difficult to yeah. have a mentor with you unless unless you make arrangements in advance for somebody to meet you. And, we well, and, that, and that may be something that this special interest group can get going because um, as many people as I've taught, you, you, some, some people get it instantly and some people just aren't comfortable until somebody's standing there and they can just move their hand a fraction of an inch and they see that the cut changes. And so. Right. Good point. And we just need to get more organized around that because my personal opinion is that getting to comfort zones in any of these topics requires a little bit of an assist. And you just wanna be able to turn to somebody and say, can you show me this? Or I have a question or doubt, or if there's somebody around that eases you past those first few hurdles to the point where you get to be settled in, then you're not gonna progress. And so we need more people to feel comfortable turning in the shop, turning at home, and we have to figure out how to get them to that point. And I think we've heard several great examples here. So these would be good inputs for us as we plan to go forward on not only what to do within the special interest group, but how the special interest group can affect policy at the shop, priorities at the shop, scheduling at the shop. We're a voice, if we're organized. So um, any other comments on this? I think I, I'd, I'd like to make a comment is that right now, it seems <laughs> I'm the go-to person for everything. So if somebody wants to be mentored, they always come to me. and. Uh, Obviously, I don't have all the time in the world, so it would be nice through this group if we could post a list of people that are a little more advanced that are willing to do a little uh, mentoring so that they could come in and help somebody if they have a shop slot or you know, like I scheduled for next Sunday, the four people to come in and just practice spindle turning. Um, but it's really hard to get those scheduled. With classes going on all the time, it's hard to find a time when the shop is just open and quiet so that we can set up all four lathes and have people practicing. But there is a version of what you said, Mary, which should be pretty easy to set up, which is a list of people who are willing to mentor. Exactly. If we knew 15 people, 10 people, even five people who are willing to occasionally meet someone at the shop when they had a shop slot, 
and just work them through the basic tools and making sure they could do what they needed to do. And, and, and then I don't know how that how that happens <laughs> with COVID. Yeah. Right. No, I'm thinking trying to limit the number of people in the shop. Right, Gary. But I mean, I'm thinking longer term here. You're right. In the very near term, we'd have an issue. But maybe it's July, and all of a sudden yeah. we're back up to normal. If we just had that list and we posted it on our on our SIG page, you know, that's a reference for people to then reach out and get some coordination so that you can be met at the shop and get that kind of help. That's what we can do as we get organized. So that was a that was a very good suggestion. Thank you. Uh, and all this is being recorded, and so we'll add it to our list of going forwards. But go ahead with the question. Uh, I just wanted to suggest, uh, uh, as far as the mentorship goes, like Bob Stevenson uh, would have people like myself. I've been over to his shop uh, several times, and he's helped me out with different projects. So it may not be just that there's problems getting access to the to our shop, but maybe some of the mentors might be willing to have uh, people coming over to their house where they have their own lays and equipment so uh, uh just having that list of mentors who um have the skill set and the equipment and that wouldn't have a problem with people coming over and they can work through their individual problems uh, in their own place yes that, hey, travis that's what the wood turners do and it right. works out really well and I, I believe you've told me that in the past too mark so yes we will um Take that under advisement because that deals with the issue of the constraint in the shop and there's no reason for it to have to be in the shop so it's a great point to make and uh, obviously the wood terms have got it right there other comments so we need to just um, mention the penn state thing uh yeah sure do you want to sure so if you're on this um chat right now on this if, if you want to be a part of the 10% discount through Penn State Industries, if you could email me your name, your address, your phone number, and your email, well, your email address, <laughs> uh, all of those things are things that they want on their list. So Gary's putting those all together and we'll be sending those in from time to time. So as of today, if, if you want, to sign up for that, you can either email me or email Gary Anderson directly. And guys, just so you know, we don't make SDFWA membership information available to the outside world. That's why we're having to go through this extra step of asking you to opt in. Because in opting in, they get your address so they can send you their catalog. By opting in, you get their promotions in your email box. They will not give that information to anybody else. But they want it for their purposes. And yet our policy is we don't give that stuff away. You have to say, I want it to be given away. And so we actually do, as Mary suggests, we also have a web form that we can use and I'll distribute it uh, as an email to the rest of this group. Anybody who wants to get that discount can put their uh, information in this form and it shows up in a spreadsheet that Gary can use with Penn State. Um, I feel like we're kind of winding down and I think that's remarkable timing because, oh, I, I, we're not done yet, but I just wanted to say, look at your clocks, guys. It is 11 o'clock. Come on. Is that good timing? Come on. <laughs> Mary, go ahead, please. Two more quick things. I did uh, get an order of parts and pieces from Saint, um, Craft Supplies. Can you shift it over so we can see it? Craft Supplies USA. And they sent me about 12 or 15 of their catalogs. And they're out in the lobby if you want to pick one up. Kind of nice to browse it rather than scroll. The website all the time and the other thing is is i'm a big participant in our our november holiday gift sale and if you have something in particular that you like to make um and you can make a second one and donate it to us for our sale that would be wonderful um and if you feel like you're up to wanting to participate in making some Christmas trees or some little miniature birdhouses or something along those lines for our craft sale. Um, I can mentor you through the process of learning how to make it and then we can provide you with some wood and set you free. Uh, that was, I would call that one a plug. Yes. And I'd like to make one too. 
<laughs> okay? Which is the holiday gift sale is really just a variation on a special interest group, but it's a chance for you to practice something you like, which is woodworking, but on projects that you like, which might sell. And it has a good purpose in the end, which is we generate revenue for the organization. But it's not the only way that we as woodworkers can do some good with what we enjoy doing. Let me just give you three quick examples. Recently, we were working with the library in, it's called the Malcolm X Library. It's in East um, San Diego. And they needed some book carts in their children's area. Well, we put the word out and uh, we had Perry Crutchfield make this amazing book cart that is in the SpaceX rocket theme. Perfect for little kids. We also have another project that's underway right now, which is to make these folding desks I mentioned earlier. There's a school called the O'Farrell School. They have 200, 185 families that are needy and where they've done things in the past to help them and they need some desks, but in houses that have no room. So we're designing these desks that are folding desks that we will then make a few of. And if more people are interested, we'll make more of them, but we can practice our woodworking while doing some good. And the last example I want to give you has to do with these little free libraries. They're elementary schools in what's called the Diamond Neighborhoods that have of course been closed. And so the libraries there have been closed and the schools and parents are concerned to have those kids still see books and have access to books. So we have a little free library program that's underway. Two have been built. We have a plan for the first uh, Tuesday in April to make a couple of more. And if this thing grows in interest, then we'll be making more for more schools and for properties around schools where we know the kids can go pick up books. We have a partner who supplies the books, who deals with the schools, who gets the approvals, et cetera, et cetera. So we just do what we're good at and we're doing good with it. And for me in particular, whatever we're making, I don't have to find room for in my house, which is like a real plus. I don't have a wall like Sally does with 2000 masks on it. <laughs> we should be spotlighting her wall. It's just an amazing wall. But uh, that was my plug for the fact that not only are we an association, a nonprofit that is doing all the things you're familiar with, but increasingly we wanna do good for the community, taking our skills, applying them to purposeful endeavors and making a difference, and frankly, feeling good about what we do. So I'm ending that plug. That's it, just want you to know about that. We'll have more and more articles on the website. Sally has her hand up, go ahead. Uh, one of the things that our group is doing, and uh, I don't know if they're gonna, if it's gonna happen this year, we missed it last year, is there's a, a thing called Empty Bowls that was started by the Potters and you go to the event, which is usually the week before Mother's Day, it's in May usually, and you buy a bowl for $20, any bowl, there's bowls all over the place. And then you go inside and you, uh, they have a wash station if you wanna eat out of the bowl you just bought, or if you want, they have paper and there's restaurants bring in all these soups and breads and things, and it's just great. And I, so a couple of friends who are potters that were involved in it said, well, why don't the woodworkers make some wood bowls? So we've been collecting that up. And so, because once you start making bowls, you're going to be addicted. <laughs> and, you know, then you, you need to find a home for them. And, you know, after your friends all have three or four and they don't know what <laughs> to do with them. Um, so that's another outlet for getting rid of some of the stuff that you get to practice on. So I heard three plugs, one from uh, Mary, one from me, and one from Sally. The difference between theirs and mine is theirs had to do with turning, and so we're somewhat legit. Mine was not. <laughs> um, other comments before we wind this thing down? Okay, just in terms of shaking your heads, a lot of you folks now have your video turned on. Um, is a SIG something we wanna do on a monthly basis? Just nod or shake your head. I got a thumbs up from Marvin, lots of heads nodding. Okay, okay, good. Even Gary behind the camera, not showing himself does a thumbs up. Good for him. Okay, well, if there is nothing more, I'd like to really thank you folks for having joined this. Um, we do not quite know what 
this is going to look like, but we've certainly had a lot of good input. And as this community starts to grow from all the classes and all the new enthusiasm, uh, we wanna make sure that we do it right and keep that trajectory healthy and growing. So um, unless Mary, you have anything else you'd like to add or anybody else, we'll go ahead and uh, wind this down. Thank you very much for being here. Have a great weekend and I hope you get your first or second shot sometime soon. <laughs> oh, good for you, Sally. <laughs> Goodbye.